Good evening, friends. Good evening. We're very thankful that you've come and uh, to our Prophecy Encounter program. I want to welcome those who are not only here at the Church in the Valley, but also our friends who are watching via internet or satellite or one of the other many ways that they stream programming now. And if you are watching, you might want to text your friends and tell them, hey, Prophecy Encounter's on. We've got a good presentation tonight, and I know they'll enjoy that. That's right. And if you have a question and you would like to text your question, you can text it into the phone number one seven six zero five two three two two eight seven. That's one seven six zero five two three two two eight seven. So we look forward to your questions that will uh, give us opportunities to try and answer them. Amen. And tonight we're going to see how many questions we can get. Uh, before we get into the lesson. All right, our first question is this. Wasn't Jesus speaking of a secret rapture when he said in Luke 17, 46, one will be taken and the other left? All right, let's look at that together. And um, some are watching at home. If you've got your Bibles, you can go there with me. But if you look in the Gospel of Luke chapter 17, I told you this is one of the passages where Jesus gives some signs of his return. And here near the end of the chapter in verse 35... He said, well, I'll start with verse 34. I tell you that in that night, speaking of the second coming, there'll be two men in one bed. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two will be grinding together, two women. One is taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. One is taken and the other left. And people read this and they say, well, that looks like a secret rapture to me. These two people are, are doing something and, you know, two women are talking together. They're grinding the mill. All of a sudden, poof, one disappears. They're taken. The other one's left. And two men are sleeping in the bed and they wake up and one's gone. And you get two men working in the field. They're talking to each other and poof, one disappears. And isn't that the secret rapture? It's not what it's talking about. First of all, notice who is taken. Let's read the rest of the verse. After he says, two men working in the field, one taken, the other left, the disciples say to Jesus, in verse 37, where, Lord, where are they taken? You don't ask where the ones left or left. Where are they taken? Jesus says, wherever the body is, there the vultures, the eagles are gathered together. It's talking about the wicked are taken away in judgment. So, for the children of Israel, when they behaved, God left them in the promised land. When they were bad, the Israelites were carried off to Assyria, the Jews from Judah were carried off to Babylon. When they misbehaved, they were carried off. And so when he's talking about taking away, another time when Jesus is talking about the second coming, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, the wicked were taken away by the flood. Who's taken away? The wicked. The wicked. And so sometimes people even get mixed up about who's taken and who's left. But what does it mean? Two women grinding, two men sleeping in a bed, two men working in a field. All right, sleeping. How many kinds of people, what, what is sleep a symbol of in the Bible? Death. Jesus Death. said our friend Lazarus is asleep. The um, Bible talks about many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, Daniel chapter 12. How many kinds of people are asleep now? Two. two. How many resurrections will there be? Two, resurrection of life, resurrection of damnation. The Bible says the dead in Christ rise first. And so you've got two different resurrections. So it's talking about these, the, some are saved, some are lost. Outwardly, they're doing the same thing. Two women grinding. What's a woman a symbol of? Church. Church. What is the grain, the bread that women work with? The church. Okay. It's talking about the word of God. Two kinds of women in Revelation. One in Revelation 12, bride of Christ. One in Revelation 17, the apostate church. Two different kinds of truth. Grinding. One is true, one is false. Two men working in the field. What's the field? Jesus tells us, harvest is great, the labors are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to send labors out into his field. The word of God is the seed, Jesus says. Two kinds of messages out there. Two gospels, the true and the false. It's only two roads. Jesus is saying outwardly people appear to be doing the same thing. One is not ready and one is ready. And that's the message. It's not saying that all of a sudden people start disappearing. Hope that helps a little. All okay. right. Thank you. Was the devil cast out of heaven before or after the earth was created? Well, good question. We talked about the origin of evil in our last presentation. And someone's wondering, did this rebellion in heaven happen before or after? 
We believe that the rebellion in heaven happened before the earth was created. Part of the reason that God made this world and created Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and fill the earth, is because at least at that point, Satan and his angels had been cast out of heaven, but not yet cast down to the earth. God wanted to maybe help repopulate the vacuum of all those fallen angels by creating a new world and creatures in his own image. And it especially bothers the devil that devils can't procreate in their own image. Man is made in the image of God and we can procreate through love in our own image, in our children. And so the rebellion began before the world was created. After Adam and Eve listened to Satan, at that point they were cast down and restricted to this planet. All right. Why is Satan symbolized by the kings of Tyre and Babylon in the Old Testament? Oh, good. Someone was listening, and I'm trusting that you backed up and read when we quoted two passages, one from Isaiah 14 and one from Ezekiel 28. In both of those prophetic passages, it starts out talking about, Ezekiel is talking about the king of Tyre, Isaiah is talking about the king of Babylon, and then it transitions from those kings to the devil who is behind them. Now that often happens. Jesus did it to Peter. Um, in the same passage there in Matthew, Peter says to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Christ says, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven. A few moments later, Jesus said, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. I'll rise the third day. Peter said, oh, Lord, don't do that. Don't talk like that. That's not for you. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. Says that to Peter. Now, was Peter Satan or was Jesus talking to the power that was speaking through Peter, the devil? Um, who do you think it was that tried to kill Jesus as a baby? It was the devil, but he worked through a kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so in the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel, they're talking about these powers, Babylon and Tyre, that were persecuting God's people. And the prophet really then goes to the power behind the kings. And he talks about the devil and the fall of the devil. By the way, when people listen to the devil, they start bearing some of the same characteristics of pride and and conceit that Satan has. All right. What can I do to resist temptation? Well, how much time do you have? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, first of all, the Bible tells us that submit yourself to God, uh, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and Christ will draw near to you. So submit to God. How did Christ fight temptation? He said, it is written, it is written, it is written, because he had the word in his heart. He did not tell the devil, hang on, let me look this up. He had the scriptures. The Bible tells us in uh, what is it? Uh, Psalm 119, thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so we store the word of God in our hearts to fight temptation. Some other practical things. If you know you've got a temptation with alcohol, for example, and you've got to go to the market, get celery or Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Don't take your cart up the alcohol aisle on your way to get the Brussels sprouts because what you're doing is you're, you're exposing yourself to weakness. If you know that somebody or something is a problem for you, avoid that thing or that person. Don't get near the edges of temptation. You're more likely not to fall in. That's right. You're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, don't, the Bible says, don't tempt the Lord. Um, I've got a sermon online that you'll enjoy. It's called Cold Confession. I talk about a struggle that I had for uh, 40 years or more, more, uh, with substance abuse. I'm not going to tell you what it was. You've got to go watch the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> called Cold Confession. Just YouTube, Cold Confession, Doug Batchelor. But there's principles in there on how you can overcome temptation. In fact, I've got a book you can download for free. And it's tips for resisting temptation. I think I itemized 12 tips in the book. I don't have time to go through them all now. All right. What does it mean in Revelation where the woman is giving birth in front of a dragon waiting to devour the child and then having wings of an eagle to fly to a safe place? All right. I'll give you a little bit of the answer. And that ties in with something we just talked about. Uh, that's Revelation 12 talks about this woman who's standing on the moon. She's clothed with the sun. She has 12 stars above her head. 
sun, moon, stars. This is the light that God made. She's got the natural light of God. And the dragon wants to devour her man-child. We know who the man-child is because it says the man-child's born. He's caught up to God and he rules all nations with a rod of iron. That's Christ. There are seven examples in the Bible of women that had miracle babies. All of the babies were boys because they're all types of Christ. Let me see if I can remember them. Uh, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel. Karen does our checkbook. She's counting. Um, Hannah, the Shunammite woman. That's five. Elizabeth, and Samson's me. mother. Is that seven? Yes. Seven. Okay. All of them had miraculous babies. They were all barren. They couldn't have children, but an angel visited them. And in most cases, it's some kind of miracle or through prayer. They had a baby. All of those babies are types of Christ. And then the ultimate miracle birth is Mary, who would be the eighth if you're counting. And which, the Bible doesn't ever say Mary was barren. She, of course, has Jesus. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist, did I mention him? Yeah. Yeah, you did. And so you've got these miracle births. Now you get to Revelation, and a woman is bringing forth a child. And doesn't ever mention her husband. That woman represents the church that was to present the Messiah to the world. And um, the dragon is trying to devour the child as soon as it's born. When Jesus was born, did the devil try to kill Jesus through Herod and the Roman power as he was a baby in Bethlehem? And this was prophesied. It talks about Rachel weeping for her children. Rachel died in Bethlehem. And all these babies in Bethlehem were killed by Herod in an attempt to exterminate Jesus as a baby. Now, that's not the first time the devil's done that. Mm -hmm. The devil knew a Savior was coming in the days of Moses. Did the devil try to kill the Savior by killing baby boys in Moses, yes. in uh, Exodus, Moses' day? The devil knew the Savior was coming through the seed of David. Have you read in the Bible where this wicked queen named Athaliah killed all of David's descendants except one, Joash, survived? Mm -hmm. And the royal seed came through him. So there's been several attempts for the devil to destroy the man-child while it was a baby. But the man-child is caught up to the throne of God. The woman is given two wings. You know what that means? I'm not telling you because we have a lesson on it later. <laughs> Keep coming. We, we do have a lesson on the woman. All right. Well, our last question for tonight is, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit living within me? Well, we all need the Holy Spirit. You know what Jesus said, unless you are born of the water and the Spirit, Spirit you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not enough to join a church. It's not enough to say, oh, I'm a Christian and, you know, I, I take the name. There's a lot of nominal Christians that claim to be Christians, but do you have the Spirit? It's not enough to be born once. You must be born twice. Mm -hmm. Someone said once, if you're only born once, you'll die twice. If you want to avoid dying twice, you must be born twice or you'll die twice. You'll have the second death, Revelation talks about. And uh, so we need that new birth, that born-again experience. How do you know if you've received the Holy Spirit? For one thing, the Holy Spirit will bring you conviction of your sin. The Holy Spirit doesn't always make you feel good. Sometimes he makes you feel bad, like a good parent, if you're doing the wrong thing. And he brings conviction, Jesus said. He brings yeah. comfort. Um, but then you'll have the fruits of the Spirit that you read about. Jesus said you'll know them by what? Their fruits. By their fruits. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. You memorize them better than me, I think. Go ahead. Goodness, faithfulness, meekness. Help me. Gentleness. Yeah. Self-control. So, yeah, Galatians chapter 5, you'll, you'll read about the various fruits of the Spirit, and those will be seen in your life. Read 1 Corinthians 13. It talks a lot about love. And boy, that's, that'll keep you busy trying to live up to 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> and so, um, but don't be discouraged if you don't think you have all the fruits of the Spirit. We should all strive to have those things on a daily basis. To when, when we, and I pray and I say, Lord, show me when I'm acting selfish. Lord, show me. I can I'm show you. I, I prefer he shows me, actually. <laughs> he doesn't like it when I play the Holy Spirit, though. <laughs> it's a good role. So, yeah, well, sometimes God does, believe it or not, speak through your spouse. But, um, Even me. <laughs> and occasionally the other side speaks That's through That's right. Him. Oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> but uh, so you'll have these fruits in your life. Pray for them, and uh, God will give you that. And you can grow in the fruits of the Spirit. That's also part of the sanctification yeah. process. It's an ongoing process. So it's don't get that discouraged grows. if you think, I don't feel spirit-filled. 
Just continue to pray for it every day. And ask pray the Lord the to Holy help Spirit. you, and he will. Amen. All right. Our program um, for tonight is going to be called The Law of the Lamb. And just before we do that, you've noticed that Kelly has been uh, uh, joining the accompaniment out front. And she's been helping me a little bit at the conclusion of each message. And we've asked her if she'd just bring a message in, in music. Uh, Kelly's traveled with us for years. She's got several records out. And she's just a wonderful person as well. She's going to be playing the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Kelly. I always like the way she smiles when she plays. I always have to stick my tongue out when I do anything that takes that much concentration. Welcome once again, friends. We're so thankful that you've uh, come. Tonight, our lesson is a very important one. We're going to be dealing with the law of the Lamb. And in this study, as you can tell from the title... We're going to be talking about uh, a law that is much neglected. You don't hear about it much these days, dealing with the subject of the Ten Commandments. I always like to start with a, an amazing fact. I don't know if you caught this in the news. Uh, last month, somebody broke into the Salisbury Cathedral, or they were in the cathedral while it was open. They tried to break into a case that holds the most ancient, the best uh, copy of the Magna Carta. That means the great document that has been made. It is like the equivalent of the British Constitution when King John agreed with the lords to give the people their rights. And it dates back to 1200 A.D. And there a man was smashing the glass case and he actually was able to put some holes in the case with a rock 
He's going to steal this national treasure, this very rare document, and an American tourist tackled him. The guy had a knife too. And uh, they were able to stop him. Uh, I'm not sure that he was uh, wrapped tight. Uh, could have been something wrong with trying to steal something like that in broad daylight. You know, we have some documents that are very important to us, namely the Constitution. I heard about one man that bought a replica of the Declaration of Independence uh, for a garage sale for, I don't know, $2.50. He kept it for years and he sold it to someone else for $20 and he thought he did pretty good. And the guy who bought it did a little more research and he found out it was one of the few original handwritten copies. And it sold for over a million dollars. So can you imagine being that guy that sold it for 20 you know, we've got a, the most important document in the world is not anything that was written by, you know, Thomas Jefferson or Oliver Cromwell. He didn't write the Magna Carta <laughs> or any other great person in history. But there is a document that was written by God himself. And I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments spoken by the voice of God. And it's the only time that God said, I will write this part by myself, lest there be any confusion. I am the author wrote it in stone to represent its eternal, unchanging nature. And yet it's sad, but it's important, even in the church today, to let people know that Ten Commandments are still in effect. I am stunned how often I hear Christians and even pastors say, oh no, we're under the New Covenant now. We don't need to keep the Ten Commandments. And I, I just... I think that is so outrageous that it shocks me and it it's frightens me for any minister or Christian that would tell that to another person to say that what I say is more important than what God said with his own voice and wrote with his own finger to be part of his eternal moral law. Now there are laws in the Bible that were part of the old covenant that are nailed to the cross that are done away with. The Ten Commandments is not part of that. This is a very important subject to understand in connection with Revelation. Let me tell you why. Look in Revelation chapter 14. The most fearful curse ever pronounced in the Bible, it's not in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. It's in Revelation 14. The third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, this is verse 9, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself will drink the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out with full strength into the cup of his indignation and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That's pretty frightening. You know what it says right after that? That's uh, verse 10. You jump to verse 12. It contrasts the ones who worship the beast in his image with the ones who receive the seal of God and it says... Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you got two opposite extremes. One group worships the beast, and one group worships God and keeps his commandments. One keeps the law of the beast, one keeps the law of God. Why does that matter in the last days? Revelation 13, verse 15. And he was granted, talking about the beast's power, he's granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, image, that whoever, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, when we delve into Revelation, you realize that there's this beast, this antichrist power, and it's going to compel people to worship the image of the beast. It's very clear. Is there anything wrong with image worship in the Bible? Uh, yeah, that's one of the commandments. It says, thou shall not. Make unto thee any graven image, the likeness of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children unto the third and fourth generation of those that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of those that love me and keep my commandments. It's one of the longer of the Ten Commandments. Do not make images and bow down to them. Now, is it wrong to make an image? An image is a facsimile or a likeness by itself, no. If you have a photograph in your wallet of your grandchildren, that's an image. And some of you probably worship it. <laughs> if you're good grandparents, right? Everybody you meet, want to see my grandkids? 
But the Bible doesn't say don't make an image. Some people are confused about this. One church says, uh, oh, you can't even have a painting on your wall of a flower. It's idolatry. The Bible doesn't say don't make an image. It says don't make an image and bow down. Do not make images and serve them. God told the children of Israel to make images of angels and put them on the ark. He told Solomon to put these calves underneath the labor in the temple. And so there's nothing wrong with doing something like that. They weren't to pray to the likeness of anything. But here, you can read in uh, Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar told the Israelites to bow down and worship the image he made. They've got to make a decision. Are we going to obey the law of God, Ten Commandments? Or are we going to obey the law of the government, the king, Babylon? They chose to go to a fiery furnace instead of disobey God's commandments. How important are the commandments to you? Do you think that they're multiple choice? Are they ten suggestions for you? Are they commandments? Were they God's ten good ideas? Are they commandments? They were willing to die rather than bow down. Now, God delivered them in the fiery furnace... And the king said, whoever doesn't fall down and worship will be cast into the midst of the furnace. Keep in mind, when you read Revelation, out of 404 verses in Revelation, 278 are found other places in the Bible. And so they understood that you're not to pray to idols, and that's going to play out in the last days. Now you go into Daniel chapter 6. That was Daniel 3. Go to Daniel 6. Another king, not Babylon, now it's Persia. The king makes a law that everybody should pray to him for 30 days. That's Daniel 6, verse 7. Well, that's breaking the first commandment. Thou shalt not have other gods before me. Daniel said, I'm not going to worship anyone but the Lord. That's breaking the commandments. Well, you'll die. You'll go to the lion's den. So be it. Daniel was willing to die rather than disobey one of the Ten Commandments. He went to the lion's den. And what happened? God delivered him. Will God deliver us? If we take a stand, so now when you get to the last days and there's going to be a universal law that you worship the beast in his image, if God's people don't understand what it means to obey God's commandments, how are they going to discern what's right or wrong? Or how easy would it be for them to compromise? It's very important Christians understand the role of the law, and that's what we're going to delve into, and I think you'll see as we go on. All right, first question I want to ask, and by the way, this again will be in the supplemental materials online and shared here at this seminar. Can God's moral law, now the moral law is not the ceremonial law, it's the moral Ten Commandment law, ever be amended or repealed? You can read in Psalm 89 verse 34, God says, My covenant I will not break or alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. God spoke the Ten Commandments. He says, I'm not going to write this in stone and speak it with my voice and say, this is optional. He says, I'm not going to break that. It's eternal. It is always going to be wrong to kill. It's always going to be wrong to lie. It will always be wrong to steal. These are eternal moral principles. Amen? He says, I'm not going to alter it. Again, Psalm 111, verse 7 and 8. All of His commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. And David here is writing specifically about the Ten Commandments. You can read in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's in Hebrews. So the idea that God is wishy-washy about His law, he, he wrote it down with His finger, He spoke it with His voice, He's not changing that. Now, why can't God's law change, the Ten Commandments? Because God doesn't change. And the law has the same characteristics as God himself. An example, I put this up on your screen. You should be able to see it. The character of God is revealed in the law. Now, notice, the Bible says, if you look in Luke 18, 9, that God is good. The Bible also says in Romans 7 that the law is good. The Bible says that God is holy. It says in Romans 7, 12, the law is holy. Deuteronomy 32, God is just. It says in Romans 7, 12, the law is just. Matthew 5, 48, God is perfect. It says his law is perfect. And I'm going to go on. You can see the references there. God is love. We all know that. You know, the law is love. And you can read on where it says that God is, um, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. God is righteous. God is truth. 
God is pure. God is spiritual. God is eternal. God is unchangeable. Each of these same attributes, it says the very same thing about the Ten Commandments. So in order to get rid of the Ten Commandments, what must you get rid of? God. Every violation of Ten Commandments is somehow attacking the character of God because it's a reflection of who he is. Jesus was the, uh, the embodiment of the law of God. Now, according to the Bible, what is sin? Jesus came to save us from sin. What is sin? The Bible gives almost a dictionary definition. 1 John 3, verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. You can also read in Romans chapter 3, 20, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. There are other definitions. The Bible tells us anything not of faith is sin. Sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. But the best definition is the one you find in 1 John 3, verse 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. If you commit adultery, I know this is going to really shake you up, but that's a sin. It used to be. It still is. Did you know that? It's still wrong to lie. Little lies, big lies. Lying is a sin. Doesn't make God happy. He came to save us from our sins. Christians should not murder. Did you know that? <laughs> These things are wrong. <laughs> They're not optional. But we need to understand that the law of God is kind of broad and comprehensive. So to what law does 1 John 3, 4 refer? So when he says sin is a transgression of the law, which law? Notice what he says in Romans 7, verse eight, uh, 7. This is Paul. I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. That's the Tenth Commandment. So it is through the law that we have a knowledge of sin. Now, let me see if I can explain how important this is. The devil does not want you to be saved. You're not going to know that you need salvation if you don't know first you're a sinner. You still with me? Does that make sense? By the law is the knowledge of sin. I look at the law, I see I'm a sinner, I think i got a problem, I need a Savior. If you get rid of the law, there's a loss of the knowledge of sin. People think ignorance is bliss, but a lot of ignorant people are going to be lost because they don't know what they're doing wrong and they're sinning against God and they don't feel their need of a Savior. So the law is a good thing. If you go to the doctor and he looks at you and you got a rash and he says, oh, it's probably just some poison ivy or poison oak or something like that. I'll give you some ointment. The doctor knows, no, that's melanoma. But he doesn't want to upset you. So he sends you home. Um, that ignorance could be fatal. You need to know, right? And so the Lord is wanting us to know. It's the law that tells us this. Um, you can read, oh, I think I shared this with you the other night. Uh, do we need law in our society? You realize that uh, every hundred hours, more youth die in the U.S. streets from gang violence than were killed in the entire Persian Gulf War. There is so much lawlessness in our society. You know, I just, I need to tell you, and I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but we just seem to have one mass shooting after another at some point in the world. And, um, and people say, you know, I wonder, I wonder what the solution is. We need more care for, you know, mental illness, and there's all this discussion, and I never hear anybody say, Maybe we should be teaching the next generation it's wrong to kill. Do you know when I was a kid, I don't know if you had this in Canada, but when I was a kid in California, we had the Ten Commandments on the wall in public school. Did you guys ever have that here too? And then gradually they took it out because they thought, well, we can't push religion on people. And we are bending over backwards as a society not to push any kind of moral religion on our children. And they grow up and they watch violence on TV and they play games that you're just shooting everybody in the games and they don't understand how precious life is and how wrong it is to take human life because they're not being taught these morals. I think that's one of the answers right there. They've got to be taught what's right and what's wrong. In a moral society, people don't just drive a truck through a crowd to kill people for entertainment. They don't just go in a hotel room to start shooting strangers because they're raised with some compass of moral value. And that's what's being lost. So the other thing is, if we have a whole society that's being taught there's no purpose to life, you have just evolved. There's no God. There's no heaven. There's no hell. You're just a, an animal. You're an accident that's alive, self-conscious for a little while, then you die and you're gone. And you might be thinking, hey, what does it matter? It's survival of the fittest. May as well shoot everybody else. 
I believe the teaching of evolution contributes to devaluing life. Because it means life has no purpose. So if people would start teaching the principles in the Word of God, I think that would be a big part of the solution. But you just look at the, um, how people are being entertained. U.S. News and World Report, the average 18-year-old has witnessed 200,000 violent acts, including 40,000 murders on television by the time they reach the age of 18. You don't think that has an effect? Some of these kids play video games. There's one in particular that was called, I think it's still out there, Grand Theft Auto. And the person just goes through stealing cars and shooting policemen. And this young, one young man that was totally addicted to the game, um, he stole some cars, he was arrested, and then he took the policeman's gun, he shot one or two policemen, and then he said the very same words that are in the video game. We all gotta die someday. He had spent all his time just programming himself with murder, what do you expect? And so uh, we've got problems because of what we're taking in. If you keep observing lawlessness, you become like what you look at. We're transformed by beholding. Our souls are something like a photographic plate where what we continue to look at, we identify with, and it shapes our values. I remember in 2015, there was a website called Ashley Madison, and their, their slogan was, Life is short, have an affair. And there was a group, and I want to see if I can get this right, there's a group that was so disgusted as, uh, with what they were doing, they thought, we've got to shut down that site. And some, some computer hackers hacked their site, and they told them, if you don't shut down your site that's encouraging the destruction of marriages, we're going to release all the information of everybody that signed up on your site. Ashley Madison didn't want to shut down their site, so they did hack it. They did release all the information. They found there were 37 million people who had signed up to figure out how to have an affair. 37 million people. 5.5 million of them were identified as female. Um, and then I read also where there was a polling company called YouGov. It surveyed 1,000 Americans, and they found 21% of men and 19% of women admitted that they had at some time cheated on their partners. But it should be noted there was another 7% that said they would prefer not to answer the question. So I'll leave that up to you what that means. You know, there's a commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Some people think it's thou shalt not admit adultery. But it's don't commit adultery. <laughs> I heard uh, a little boy was riding home with church one day with his family, and the preacher had been talking about thou shalt not commit adultery, and he misunderstood. He said, Dad, what does it mean thou shalt not commit agriculture? <laughs> he said, well, son, it means you're not supposed to be plowing in another man's field. <laughs> So uh, that's the principle. <laughs> Did Jesus keep the Ten Commandments? Now, what is a Christian? A Christian is a follower of Christ. So what did Jesus do? How did he feel about the law? Christ said, John 15, verse 10, I have kept my Father's commandments. The only reason Jesus can die for our sins is because he was sinless. I actually did a debate with a pastor, and he said, oh, well, Jesus sinned. He wrote the law. He could change it whenever he wanted. You know, they accused Jesus of being a glutton and a wine-bibber. And someone said, oh, well, he was a glutton and a wine-bibber. It doesn't say that. It says they accused him of that. They also accused him of being a Samaritan and demon-possessed. He wasn't any of those things. Jesus said, I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. You can read in 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin, nor was there deceit found in his mouth. How much sin did Jesus commit? None. That's how he could die as our sacrifice. But Christ, unlike us, he was sinless. We're not. How many of us are guilty of sin? According to the Bible, Romans 3, 23, for all, every person who's ever been born aside from Christ, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short of what the ideal was for man to reflect the glory of God in our lives, made in his image. All have failed. All have sinned. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, Adam and Eve were made perfect, and they lived holy lives. And when they disobeyed God, something changed in their nature. And you and I have all been affected. It's in our DNA, if you will. When God made Adam and Eve, they were naturally motivated by love. Like God is love, man made in his image, 
was loving. He wasn't thinking principally about himself. But when man sinned, that compass needle got mixed up and instead of pointing towards God, it pointed back towards themselves. And as soon as God comes looking for Adam, he says, what have you done? Adam said, the woman did it. And he says, the woman, what have you done? She said, the snake did it. And God asked the snake, and he didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> and that's he, so you notice right away they start to blame. Where before there was love, now it's everybody else's fault. Man became very selfish. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. How many? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. All doing our own thing instead of going God's way. Now this is very serious. What's the punishment for sin according to the Bible? Romans 6.23, you know this. The wages of sin is death. Sin is a deadly contagious disease. God told Adam and Eve, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Someone had a question we didn't get to tonight, but I'll answer now. Why didn't Adam and Eve die that day when they sinned? Well, they did. They began to die spiritually. The process of dying, a matter of fact, in the Hebrew it says, in dying you will die. They began to die. Before every cell in their body was vital, the aging process began the day they sinned. And keep in mind, a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. That's in 2 Peter chapter 3. How long did Adam live? 930 years. And who was the oldest man who ever lived? Now, it's actually Enoch. I know you all said Methuselah. Methuselah, he died at 969, but Enoch's still alive. He's the oldest man who ever lived, right? <laughs> Enoch's the oldest man who ever died. <laughs> so all of them died in that first millennium. In the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. They did. For God, what's a thousand years? Nothing. But they began to die spiritually right then. And that's what he, I just read that to you in Genesis 2, verse 17. Do the Ten Commandments still apply to New Testament Christians? Now, this is the big question. I was just laying a foundation here. What does the Bible say? I'll be using a lot of New Testament. Jesus said, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Someone came to him and said, good master, what shall I do that I might have eternal life? Jesus said, if you would enter into life, keep the commandments. He said, which ones? Because the Jews had like 300 laws and some were ceremonial and some were, were, you know, legal laws or civil laws, health laws, all kinds of laws. Jesus began to quote exclusively from the Ten Commandments. You're not going to go to heaven deliberately killing, lying, stealing. If you've been born again, you're going to want to obey God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And with love, you can. And, you know, people make all these excuses. They say, oh, you know, we can't keep God's law because we're sinners and we're all fallen and we're all broken. And they got all these wonderful excuses. I'm just telling you, that'll never work for me. I can't come home to Karen and say, well, dear, I know I committed a little adultery this week, but, you know, we're all fallen creatures. And, uh, <laughs> and you understand, I'm sure, that just it's in our nature that we just can't change. Now, if I love her, am I going to keep that commandment? Absolutely. And I have. Because I love her. And she has. So when people start making all these excuses for sin, you're really making your devil bigger than your God. You're saying, I know the devil can tempt me to... I was doing this uh, a debate on television in uh, San Francisco, or just outside San Francisco. And um, John Lomacain and I were debating two other ministers on the subject of the law. And one was saying, we're not required to keep the Ten Commandments. That's Old Covenant. Nobody can keep the Ten Commandments. And I said, really, which ones are you breaking? He didn't answer that. No, I didn't really say that part. <laughs> but I said, oh, brother, do you believe the devil can tempt us to sin? He said, yes. I said, do you think that Jesus can keep us from sin? He said, well, you know, the spirit of the law, but not the letter of the law. And I said, wait a second. You're telling me the devil can tempt us to sin, but you don't really believe Jesus can keep us from sin. So you're saying, you think your devil's more powerful than your God. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I've just seen so many changes in my life, and don't misunderstand. I still got a long way to go. But I believe that God, 
who has brought me this far can be the author and finisher of my faith. He who has begun a good work and you will perform it, he'll complete it, and that you can grow and be sanctified. Karen was saying, we continue to grow in our obedience. But you need to make up your mind as soon as you decide to follow Jesus, what's my marching orders? Well, Jesus said, repent of your sins. Well, where do I begin? Start with the Ten Commandments. And I might pause and say right here, if you've not done this and you're a Christian, you really should. Have you confessed your sins to God? A lot of people say a prayer, but they don't really get very specific. Get by yourself sometime. You might get on your knees and just look at the Ten Commandments and say, well, I've never killed. Well, Jesus said, if you hate your brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder. Say, well, I don't curse. Jesus said, let your yes be yes or your no be no. Well, I don't commit adultery. If you look on the opposite sex and lust in your heart, so sin is not just an action, it's an attitude. And so when we consider, have we had the attitudes of sin? We should say, Lord, I've been sinful in my mind, in my heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. Lord, will you, I am guilty of these things. I confess I'm a sinner. Be open to God. You might even make a list. Just don't let anyone get it. Make a list and say, Lord, I am guilty of these things. Will you please forgive me? What is the promise in the Bible? If we confess our sins, 1 John chapter 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from 50% of our unrighteousness. Oh, that's not what it says. It says all unrighteousness. That means if you do that, you can get off your knees believing the blood of Christ has forgiven all your sins. And when you do that, every time you confess your sin, you're acknowledging something is wrong and you're giving the Holy Spirit permission to help you do the right thing. So be open and honest with God if you're struggling. He said, if you'll enter into life, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Look at uh, Revelation 22. This is the end of the Bible. Blessed, it doesn't say miserable, blessed are those who do his commandments that they might have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates of the city. It's a blessing. The Bible says his commandments are not grievous. I'll tell you, since I made up my mind to obey the commandments, I haven't been in jail. I used to visit jail periodically. Uh, now I visit people in jail, but I wasn't there myself. And uh, I don't wake up hungover. I don't have that kind of guilt. I mean, it's so much better to obey God. You have so much more of an abundant life. And the devil wants people to think, oh, you know, Christians don't have any fun. If you obey God, you're going to be miserable. It's a lie. Amen. Peace of mind and peace of conscience I'll tell you, it makes a soft pillow at night when you know your sins are forgiven. Blessed. Now, the Bible tells us that the law is something like a mirror, and you can read about that in James 1, 23 through 25. Let me illustrate something real quick. And I usually do this uh, during the presentation at some point because it, it, it just really helps get the point out there. All right. Now, if I were to come out here and continue the rest of the presentation, how many of you would be a little bit distracted? By <laughs> You'd be, I'd say, no, just whatever you do, don't pay any attention to the big black mark on my forehead. <laughs> What's the first thing you're going to think about? <laughs> All right. Now, do you see something that would be wrong with my appearance? Are you aware that I don't see anything wrong? So, how are you going to convince me I need to make a change? A mirror, but I don't know where I'm going to find a mirror a time like this. Oh, look, isn't that convenient? So, let me see. So, let's suppose for a moment, thank you, Miss Bachelor. Let's suppose for a moment that this, the Bible says the law is like a mirror. This represents the law of God. And I feel fine. I'm preaching along and everything's great. And, and then I go like this. I go, oh, wow, that's embarrassing. Now, I, I felt fine until I looked in the mirror and I saw, oh, man, I got a big black mark on my forehead. And I always worry when I do this presentation, some kids out there on the couch with their mom watching the program and going, Pastor Doug's got the mark. Look at that. <laughs> and, and so uh, I, I feel okay, and then I look in this, and then I don't feel so good. So clearly this is the problem. So if I just throw this away, if I break this, everything's okay now. I felt fine until I looked in the mirror. I remember not too long ago I was... Um, I was going through security in an airport, 
And, you know, they make you take your jacket off and you take everything off and you go through and you kind of reassemble yourself, you know what I'm talking about. And um, I noticed that one businessman, he was trying to get himself together. And, and sometimes a man, if you're rushing, you put your jacket on, you get your collar all flipped up inside backwards and it just lowers your perceived IQ if you're walking around like that. <laughs> and so I don't know if you've ever had the, the gall to walk up to someone and say, you know, you're... And, you know, sometimes ladies help each other out when there's extra material flopping around. And, but guys don't usually do that, you know. And, but I went up to this one guy and I thought, hey, let me help you with that. And I, I flipped his collar around. He gave me the strangest look. And I thought, you know, I didn't want to offend him, but he just gave me a strange look. And so I went on my way. I went into the restroom and I looked in the mirror. My collar was all flipped up inside out. <laughs> I had come through line. Mine was all backwards. I'm saying, here, let me help you with that. I look at me and he's thinking... You ought to get the moat out of your own eye before you help anybody else. <laughs> so it wasn't until I looked in the mirror and I thought, oh, that was really dumb. <laughs> I wish I could say that's the only time I've walked and looked in the mirror and thought, oh my, I just preached a sermon like this. <laughs> I was doing a program once in New York City, a live program. Thousands of people are watching. And it wasn't until the end of the program... I, the dressing room was really dark and I had several suits back there and I walked out I didn't realize I had the pants that didn't match my jacket. <laughs> I never looked down to check until the program was over. Anyway, so a mirror can be a problem. They can make you uncomfortable. So you just get rid of the mirror, everything's okay, right? Is there anything wrong with the mirror? Or is the mirror doing what it's supposed to do? So if the mirror shows me I've got a problem, then obviously the mirror should be the solution. So I take the mirror and it's supposed to fix it. Is that the function of the mirror? No. So what am I going to do? That's not fair. The mirror shows me, but it doesn't help. What does this represent? The law. Is the law supposed to take away our sin? No. It shows us our sin. So what do I need? The law to take away my sin? What will wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, where am I going to get a symbol for the blood? Same place I got a symbol from here. <laughs> so... This is the law. This represents the blood of Christ. So this shows me my problem. I say, oh, I got a problem. What am I going to do? Then you go and you wash. I did this illustration one time with a permanent marker, and that was a bad idea. <laughs> I thought it was one of the erasable markers. So the blood takes away the mark, and then I look and I go, oh, this isn't so bad. Look at that. I feel fine now. And so the law doesn't take away our sin. It shows us our sin. Now, if you're the devil... You don't want anyone to know about this because they might find a need for this and the devil doesn't want people going to Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think this is real important to illustrate. Do we still need the law even after Jesus comes? Do we still need the blood of Christ after Jesus comes? Amen. All right, back to our, our slides here. We've got several more scriptures to cover. So how is it possible for us to obey and keep God's commandments? Is the law just supposed to make us feel bad? Romans 8, 3, and 4. God sending his own son condemned sin in the flesh. In his life he condemned sin. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. We don't walk after the flesh. We walk after the spirit. The flesh does not control you. The flesh shall not have dominion over you. The Lord reigns in your life when you've been born again. The promise is, Philippians 1, 6, He that has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. As you continue to follow the Lord, now there will be many times on a daily basis you're going to look at the, the will of God, the law of God, you're going to say, oh, I need to make a change here. I need to make a change there. And if you sin, you keep going back to the blood. There is a fountain filled with blood. God sends his son's grace and his blood to continually be washing us as we strive to do his will. Now, will everybody be in heaven? Who's going to heaven? Not everyone, but they that do the will of my Father in heaven. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. This is 1 John chapter 2, starts with verse 15. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world, and the world will pass away and the lust thereof. But, notice, he that does the will of God will abide forever. What is the will of God? Psalm 40, verse 8. Yea, I love to do thy will. Your law is in my heart. 
The law of God is the most basic, simple expression of his will. What's the, what are the two great commandments? Love the Lord with all your hearts and love your neighbor as yourself. And you find, they say that's the new covenant. Where do you first find the new covenant? In the Old Testament. It's Moses who says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart. Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. And you read in Leviticus 19, 18, Moses again, Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. So these are not new commandments. Jesus was telling the disciples a new concept. He said, don't just look at the letter of the law. Look at the attitude. You see, it all sums up in one word. Love. God is love. When you have the Spirit of God, you have love. You'll have love for God. You'll have love for your fellow man. Two great statements of Christ. In uh, Matthew chapter 11, he says, come to me. And in Matthew 28, he says, go for me. Tell the world. Salvation is a horizontal and a vertical love relationship. We come to the Lord in this love relationship. Then we go for the Lord horizontally, tell our neighbors, serve our neighbors in this love relationship. It's all love. The Ten Commandments encompass that. The first four commandments deal with our love relationship to God. The last six commandments deal with our love relationship with each other. It's like I got two arms, I got ten fingers. I got to love God, love your neighbor. And so you manifest love for God by obeying the first four. You manifest love for your neighbor by obeying the last six. Amen. You know, even the Lord's Prayer is divided up in seven petitions where the first 40% deal with your relationship with God. The last 60% deal with your relationship with your fellow man, just like the Ten Commandments. But there are Christians who say you don't need to keep the Ten Commandments. And that, like I said, that's a doctrine of devils and it, it troubles me. I can do how much through Christ? Can we obey? I can do all things through Jesus who strengthens me. Now, is there a difference between the New and the Old Covenant? Yes. Why did the Old Covenant fail and what is it? All right, let's talk about that. This is real important. You read in Deuteronomy 4 when Moses is rehearsing the history of Israel. Verse 13, He declared to you His covenant which He commanded you to perform even ten commandments. So what's the covenant? And He wrote them on two tables of stone. The ten commandments are the Old Covenant. Now, what was the New Covenant? It's the Ten Commandments, but it's written in the heart. Why is there a difference? What happened? You remember after Moses received the Ten Commandments from God, he went down the mountain, and what were the children of Israel doing? He'd been up there 40 days. They got impatient. They never thought he was coming back. It's kind of like Christians today who wonder if Jesus is coming back, and we start to misbehave. Same thing happened. And they made a golden calf. They broke all the commandments. Moses threw the commandments out of his hand. And they broke, and they broke the, the covenant right then. Why? Was the law bad or was their promise bad? You see, when God first spoke the Ten Commandments, the people were listening before he even wrote them. Exodus 19. Sorry, Exodus 20 is this part. They gather in Exodus 19. They cleanse themselves. He speaks to them in Exodus 20. And when he declares the Ten Commandments, the people say, we agree. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. All the Lord has said, we will do. They made a promise. We will do it. It's based on their promise. But did they keep their promise? No. So he said he's going to make a, a new covenant with better promises. God says, I'm going to do it. Notice the new covenant, Hebrews 8.8. 8. And by the way, Hebrews is quoting the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31.31. 31. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I'll write my law in their hearts. Now, was the law changed? No. The place where it is written is changed. He now puts it in the heart, but he still wants you to keep the law. If you've got the new covenant, if you say, I'm a new covenant Christian, now I can kill. That's not what it's mean. I'm a new covenant Christian. I can commit adultery. I can pray to idols. No. The Ten Commandments are still foundational. Amen? Upon which law is the new covenant based? Notice in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, This is the covenant that I will make, says the Lord God. I will put my law in their minds. Instead of the people saying, we will do it, God said, I will do it. I'll write my law in their mind. I'll put them in their hearts. I'll be their God, and they will be my people. 
So Moses receives the second tables. He puts them in the ark. And God wants to put that table of law in our holy of holies, in our mind. The law of God in our hearts. That's what it means. Doesn't living under grace make keeping God's commandments or his law non-essential? Have you heard that before? Oh, we don't need to keep the law. We're under grace. That's really absurd. What does it mean to be under grace? Let me, let me see if I can illustrate this. Uh, I'm driving down the road. This actually happened a couple times. And uh, I'm not paying attention and I'm going too fast. And I see the, the blue and the red lights behind me. But I'm in a hurry, so I say, I'll oh, forget about that. And I just keep going. No, I don't do that. But someday I might tell you the story where I got into a chase with a policeman where a policeman was chasing me for quite a while. But I don't have time right now. <laughs> anyway, so this time I say, oh, I don't want to stop, but I've got to stop. And so I pull over. And uh, he comes up to me and he said, you know, the law says 55 and you're going 65. And then I, I say to the policeman, I say, I am so sorry, officer. I, you know, I was preoccupied. I just came off the freeway. And I, I, I say, just have mercy on me. My insurance is going to go up or whatever it is I'm telling him. And, <laughs> and he says, all right, tell you what. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you grace. I'm going to let you off the hook. Um, you're forgiven. What's more, you broke the law. I'm going to pay your ticket. Now, no one's ever said that to me. But just wouldn't that be impressive? You deserve a ticket, and I'm going to pay it. So when I hear that, I go, Phew. now, this has happened several times. I've, I've, I've found what worked for me the best is I just say, officer, I'm sorry. Can you please have mercy? My insurance is going to go up, and I just ask for mercy. Don't lie, you know. <laughs> and uh, I remember this one policeman, he kept running my plates. He said, your plates aren't showing up. What's, where'd this car come from? What does this mean? Zero, four, one, B, two, one. I said, O for you to be one, two. one, two, yeah. My license plate used to say, O for you to be one, two. It said, but he thought it was a zero. It says, O for you to be one, two. I'm talking about a Christian. O for you to be one, two. It's about the longest sentence you can get on a license plate. Isn't that neat? <laughs> anyway, so he's trying to figure it out. I told him what it meant, and I talked, and he said, all right, I'm going to have mercy on you. And so once he went back to his car, I went, praise the Lord, I'm no longer under the law. I now have grace. So I rev my engine, and I put it in second gear, and I pop my clutch, and I do a wheelie with my pickup truck, and I'm spraying gravel all over his windshield as I peel away. Hallelujah, I'm not under the law anymore. I'm under grace. I can break the law. Is that what you do? No. no. Boy, I tell you what, I put on my blinker, and I look both ways, and I look under my seat. I look everywhere. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, and I slowly, I wait until there's no cars for three miles, and I slowly inch out on the road, and I put along like it's a Model T Ford, you know, because now I'm under grace. I'm really being careful. Isn't that right? So when you're under grace, it doesn't mean that now you can break the law. What Paul is saying, he says you're not under the law. It means because of Jesus, you are not under the penalty of the law. You're no longer under the death penalty. But shall I continue in sin that grace might abound? God forbid. That's what he says. And then people are saying that today. Even pastors, oh, you can keep on sinning because you're under grace. No, he wants you to be overcomers. Seven times in Revelation, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. Romans 6, 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Romans 3, 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Paul says, Romans chapter 2, verse 13. It's not on your screen. I just thought of it. He's not justified that here's the law, but he will be declared justified that is a doer of the law. Paul is really clear. People try to make Paul say it's okay to break the law. He doesn't say that. Jesus said, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to be fulfilled, to, be, to fail, rather. Some people say, well... Um, Pastor Doug, didn't Jesus say that, you know, uh, heaven and earth will pass away, uh, but, you know, the law has been fulfilled now. Yeah, he did say fulfilled. And, and that's um, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Um, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, but he that does the will of my Father. 
And Jesus said that we are to be doers, not hearers of the word. Um, John the Baptist, when he baptized Jesus, he said, Lord, uh, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, suffer to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Does fulfill mean do away with? He said, heaven and earth will not pass until all is fulfilled from the law, until it is fulfilled. Fulfilled means kept. Jesus fulfilled the law. He kept the law. He didn't do it so we can break it. Fulfilling righteousness does not mean doing away with it. Christ said, do not think I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. He's saying, don't think it, and yet that's what people are thinking. Jesus wants us to be doers. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Are people saved by keeping the law? Is anyone saved by keeping the law? No, we're not teaching legalism. We are all saved by grace through faith. The Bible is very clear, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, and this used to be what Protestant theologians and pastors would teach. There are a couple of examples. You've heard of the great evangelist Dwight Moody, founded the Moody Bible Institute. He said, the commandments of God given to Moses in Mount Horeb are as binding today as ever they have been since the time when they were proclaimed in the hearing of the people. Billy Graham, who recently passed away, I remember Karen and I went and saw one of his campaigns in Sacramento 20-something years ago. Someone asked, he had a question and answer article in the Dallas paper. Someone asked the question, does God still expect us to keep the Ten Commandments? Here's his answer. The Ten Commandments are just as valid today as when God gave them to Moses over 3,000 years ago. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law. And I say, amen. But there are a lot of pastors that are teaching something different. And basically, they're empowering their people to sin by saying, oh, God, just love you. Just keep on sinning. Don't worry about it. Now, a pastor has a challenge. Pastor's job is to make the uncomfortable comforted. But you've also got a job to make those who are too comfortable uncomfortable. And you're always struggling with that balance. There's some people who are so beat up with guilt, they don't think God will ever forgive them. We want to assure them of God's grace and forgiveness, right? But then you got the ones who've been in church for years, and they were a little convicted about a sin when they joined the church, but 20 years go by, and they're no longer convicted. And they say, oh, God's grace, and they're making no effort to live holy lives. Those people need to be made uncomfortable because Jesus will declare to many, I don't know you. Depart from me who work iniquity. And that word iniquity means lawlessness. Ye who are lawless, depart from me. What motivates a person to keep God's law? Fear? Well, that might be a starting point. I mean, as long as they don't break into your house, you don't care if the crooks are afraid or, or just love you, right? <laughs> you just want them to obey. So even if your motives are wrong, do the right thing. The best reason to obey is what? Love. Now, you realize there is a law that says you're not supposed to murder your children. How many of you know that? That's probably why you're not killing your kids, right? <laughs> do you ever think, oh, boy, I'd like to murder them, but oh, it's against the law. I hope not. The reason you don't do it is because you love them. You don't even think about the law, right? That's when you're born again. You start wanting to do God's will because you love him. Wouldn't you all like to have that problem? You love God so much you're not even tempted. That you could just have that love. So what's the key? Turn your eyes on Jesus. The more you know Jesus, the more you'll love him. The more you love him, the better you'll obey him. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And 1 John 3, verse 5. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. That's written by the apostle of love. And John also had quite a bit to say about the law. Can I be a true Christian without keeping his commandments? Again, 1 John 2, verse 3. Hereby do we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he goes on to say, he that says I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. We've got a, uh, a saying, it says that's a slam dunk. 
You know what I mean by that? This is a slam dunk scripture. For people who think you can be a Christian and it doesn't matter if you obey, what does John say? This is New Testament. This is the apostle of love. He says, if you're saying that I love him and you keep not his commandments, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. If people start making excuses for sin, they don't understand what their salvation cost. If you love Jesus and you know those nails represent your sin that pinned him the, to the tree and, and the crown on his, thorn, on his brow and the spear in his side and all of that is because of our sins. Why would we want to flaunt the thing that hurt Jesus so much? So the idea that it's okay for Christians to continue in disobedience it's not the Bible teaching. Uh, the devil loves that idea. That people will presumptuously be thinking, I can just continue willfully going on into sin and just say, Lord, forgive me, and not really care, not really repent. And the Bible says, no, you don't understand what it cost. What was it that nailed, what law, rather, was nailed to the cross? So the Bible talks in Colossians about a law that's nailed to the cross. What law is that? You read that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. I want to, I've underscored some words I want you to especially notice. It says here, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, handwriting, ordinances, that was against us. Notice this, which was contrary to us, taking it out of the way and nailing it to his cross. So what was nailed to the cross? The ordinances that were handwritten that were against us. What was what were the handwritten ordinances? Now it says in Exodus 32, verse 16, the tables were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tables with the finger of God. But there's handwriting. It says the ceremonial law was written by the hand of Moses. So you've got the ceremonial law. The Ten Commandments were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, in the golden box, whereas the ceremonial laws were written on parchment and they were placed in a pocket on the outside. You read in 2 Chronicles 33, verse 8, They will take heed to do all that I've commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinance by the hand of Moses. So you get the finger of God on stone in the Ark. You got the hand of Moses on parchment in the outside of the ark. Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant before the Lord your God. Why? That it might be a witness against thee. What law was nailed to the cross? The ones that were against us, it said. Ceremonial laws, talking about the sacrificial system and circumcision. Paul is very clear that those things are not mandatory. But the Ten Commandments... It's not, again, it's not multiple choice. Having abolished the law of commandments contained in what? Ordinances. So Paul in Colossians chapter 2 is very clearly talking about, can you nail stone to anything? It's not talking about the Ten Commandments. It's talking about the parchment. It's talking about the ceremonial law, the ordinances. And it tells us that they consisted of yearly Sabbaths and meat offerings and drink offerings. And you can read Leviticus 23 and find out about that. So this point of confusion is the reason that a lot of pastors say, oh, that's the law that was nailed to the cross. God didn't nail the Ten Commandments to the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, did something happen in the temple? Yeah, the veil in the temple was torn. Ceremonial law completed. No longer do we need to sacrifice lambs. Jesus is the Lamb of God. The Bible says it's not physical circumcision. It's a circumcision of the heart that God wants now. But the idea that he died on the cross so now we can lie, it's crazy. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, So let no one judge you in food or drink regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths. That's plural. That's talking about the annual ceremonial Sabbaths, not talking about the one that was in the Ten Commandments, which are shadows of things to come. These things were shadows. But the substance is of Christ. Now, why is this especially important? Who does the devil especially hate in the last days? The dragon, Revelation chapter 12, 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman. This is the true bride of Christ. And he goes to make war. This is the final war, battle of Armageddon. Who does he fight against? The remnant, the remainder of her seed, her descendants that do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Is the devil making a war against those that keep his commandments today? 
He's doing it through propaganda and subterfuge and getting people to think, oh yeah, I'm not afraid that they go to church. Just don't obey. You can do whatever you want and call it religious. You can sing whatever you want. You can try and announce yourself to be a Christian, but just don't live a pure life. Don't obey me. That's what the devil's after. So what are the glorious promises God gives to those that obey? John 15, verse 11. These things I've spoken to you that your misery might be complete. No, your joy might be full. The Bible says he that keeps the law, he's unhappy. Happy is he. Great peace, the Bible says. Have they that love your law. I like this picture of the baby. Doesn't he look like he's really enjoying himself? <laughs> Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing will offend them. Don't you want that peace, friends? Amen. You know, I remember hearing a story about this man was driving too fast through a suburban neighborhood, and he didn't realize that there was a policeman parked up the street that saw him. He didn't slow down for a stop sign. He just kind of went speeding on through because he could kind of see up and down the street. He didn't see the policeman, though. And sure enough, policeman pulled in behind him, turned on the lights, pulled him over. Oh, the guy was, he was so aggravated. He was in a hurry, and he didn't need another ticket, and it was going to be a real problem for him. Policeman came up, and he rolled down his uh, window, and he started that same speech, you know. Oh, officer, can you please just don't, don't give me a ticket this time. He says, I'm sorry. He said, there's no traffic. And he said, I slowed down. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, my insurance is going to go up, and I'll never hear the end of it at home. And it, please, can you just let me off this one time? And the officer didn't say anything. He took a couple steps away from the window and began writing. And the guy thought, oh, man, he's going to give me a ticket. And he was so aggravated, he's just pounding on the dashboard and he's folding his arms and he's fuming while the policeman's back there writing and when the policeman comes back he just lowers his window this far and the policeman slips the ticket inside and it falls in his lap the policeman gets in his car and drives away and the guy picked up the ticket and he's so angry and he realized it wasn't a ticket it was a note and the note said Bob I think we go to the same church uh, I'm going to show you mercy today my daughter was killed by someone speeding three years ago, and I'm struggling to forgive them. I'm trying one more time to practice forgiveness. Would you please slow down? And after something like that happens, do you think he was able to slow down? When he realized that speeding cost that officer his child? What did sin cost God? God so loved the world that he gave his son and it's our disobedience. The best we, reason to obey God is because you love him. How do you love him? We love him because we see he first loved us. What is it that brings us to repentance? The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. When we see how good God is, when we see how much he loves us, when we see what our sins have cost, it ought to break our hearts. And that's where the new birth begins, is there at the foot of the cross when you see Jesus and you see that he loves you. He's desperate to save you. Save you from what? You'll call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Oh, Lord, I'm just so captivated. I'm so held by sin. You're not a better sinner than Jesus is a Savior. Whatever your sins are, cast yourself on the Lord. He can give you a new heart. He can transform you. You just come just like you are. Don't worry, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to live tomorrow. You come to him today, and then you just follow him one day at a time. If you slip, he'll forgive you. He'll pick you up. But continue to keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is our example. Did he obey? So we strive to be like Christ, to live in a way that will please him. This is what it means to be a Christian. Christians are not just forgiven. Christians become new creatures. He wants to transform you, give you a new heart and a new life, and ultimately a new home in his kingdom. That can begin tonight. Would you like to have that? And you who are watching, would you like to have that? Jesus died to make it possible for you to be a new creature. He's done it for me and millions of others. He can do it for you, friends. Let's ask him together as we close, shall we? Can we bow our heads? Father, we, we thank you for the love we can't comprehend that you would send your beloved son, that you love infinitely more than we love our children,
but you love us so much that you offered him to die in our place. He suffered for all the bad we've ever done that we might trade places. He took our sin and he's offering his righteousness. He took our weakness and he offers his strength. He took our sin and offers us his purity. Lord, we accept that sacrifice. Thank you so much. Help us know what it means to confess and repent of our sins and then by your grace walk in a newness of life. I pray this might be our experience, Lord. Give us the power. You promised to give us power to become your children. We pray for the power of your spirit now. Thank you for blessing these meetings. And I pray that you'll continue to touch hearts through the gospel. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, friends. God bless you. When is our next meeting? Every night this week, tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about a woman rides the beast. Very important subject. One of the most important. Please don't miss it. Come and tune in. God bless you.